Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give a shout out to my sponsors at Blue Chew, a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis in a chewable form that you can get online and discreetly. Um, you can try it for free for the first month. Go to bluechew.com and use code Holly at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. Okay, so my guest today is somebody who I definitely have owed an interview to for a while, and we'll get into that. She's a star on the rise with multiple AVN nominations under her belt. She's here today to talk about her whirlwind few years and why she's not slowing down anytime soon. Welcome, Kimmy Kim. Oh, thank you so much. So I'm welcome. so glad we got the cameras to work this time. I know, <laughs> I know. To give it some context for you guys, so... I was doing interviews at ABN, was it last year or the year before? I think it was last year. I think it was last year too. No, it wasn't. It was, it was the, the year, year before. before. Time passes quickly. I know. It's crazy. So I was doing <laughs> interviews and usually at ABN I do, you know, I try to like get a bunch of girls in. It's like 15 minutes each because like it's just a crazy hectic place and everyone's yeah. got somewhere to be. Even though I try to put buffers in my schedule because I understand some people are going to be running late and it takes forever to get from one place to another yeah, at ABN because everybody was, stops you. And it was my first year at that place. So mm. I was so confused. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, at the uh, where. Oh, my God. Where was it? I have it? no idea. I can't even think right it now. It wasn't the Hard Rock. It was the other place. Not the Virgin because that's where it's going that's to be. Which was the Hard Rock. It was at... Well, I am having a complete and Resorts brain fart. Resorts world. world. Thank you. Yes. Oh my God. Resorts world. And uh, <laughs> so anyways, so I had finished with my last guest and the cameras basically stopped working and Kimmy showed up like on time, <laughs> ready to go. And I had had a lot of other people who were late and the camera stopped working. And I had to tell her basically that like I couldn't do her interview. And I felt so horrible. I was like, I know we don't. Like, oh no. <laughs> I know. And I'm sure like you probably didn't think about it that much. Not at all. But that moment has haunted me oh. for years. I'm not joking. Like it, I felt, I just hate to be. Now you avoid me at parties. Yeah. I'm just <laughs> There's that girl that I didn't do an interview with. But I did feel really terrible because I just, I don't know. Like I don't like to be a bitch. Oh, and I it, didn't think that at all. I, I was know. just like, oh no, like I hope like you get it fixed. I know, but you know, like crushing sense of responsibility I feel, that I, I feel. walk around with. I just felt really bad. So I'm glad that you're here today. I'm glad too. Yeah. I'm so glad we made it work. We did we make it work. We finally are doing it. <laughs> we did. So um, let's start from the beginning. And I mean the very beginning. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and growing up in Georgia, right? Yes. So I grew up not in the city either. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Georgia, which is already very much so the South, the Bible Belt, and um, north of the city. So I was, well, my family, and there was one other family that I knew that was Asian in like our whole entire town. Yeah. So it was incredibly like lonely and isolating, and it felt like... I was getting bullied for bringing rice to school for lunch, and I hated that. So I never did it again after that because <laughs> I was, like, five when yeah. I, like, brought rice to lunch. And then everyone was like, ew, that's disgusting. Like, what is that? And so Wait, I just they, never did it again. They've never had rice before? Right. Well, it was, like, rice and, like, borgulgi, which is, like, just, like, a Korean meat. Okay. And so it was just rice and meat, but right. everyone was like, oh my God, that's disgusting. Like, what is that? Like, I bet you eat dogs and like, I bet that's like a chihuahua in there and oh so on God. and so forth. And so I just never did that again. And then after that, I like really, really, really wanted to be blonde and blue eyed. Mm -hmm. And I would beg my mom for like highlights at least or like mm -hmm. contacts. And she constantly was just like, no, like you're not getting that. You're seven. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not <laughs> dying my seven-year-old's hair blonde. Yeah. <laughs> like, you're fine. You'll survive. But um, I wanted that for a long time until really like adulthood. Mm -hmm. And then once I reached adulthood, I was like, okay, I, I'm happy with being Asian. Yeah. 
because then I came out here too. And I was like, whoa, there's a lot of other Asians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know when you come to like a cosmopolitan city like yeah. LA, there's all kinds of people here. My first concert out here, I literally looked at like around and I was like, oh my God, there's so many Asians here. And my friend goes, yeah, we're in LA. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, like this is unheard of in Georgia. Well, in my part of Georgia. <laughs> right. So did you always feel like so isolated because you were Asian? Like, did that always, was that always present in like your everyday interactions or did it just surface sometimes? Well, there was always at least one other Asian, mm -hmm. but usually only one. Right. And sometimes that felt good because they were also like an Asian American that understood. But sometimes it also felt even worse because then I felt not Asian enough. Like I remember so vividly once I reached middle school that there was another Asian girl that I met and her name was Karen, which is so funny. But she was like, oh, you don't speak Korean. And I was like, Oh, like I, I used to go to Korean school and I, so I know a little bit. And she was like, Oh, well, I've been fluent, you know, forever and blah, blah. blah. And like now, so like I'm bilingual and yeah. So it can go either way. Wow, where, that's crazy where you didn't feel like you belonged in either world. Yeah. That's got to be really hard. It's probably still something that vexes me because yeah. I don't feel like American enough because of the way that I grew up. Yeah. But I also don't feel Asian enough because I grew up in America. Right. And that's also just completely different than growing up in Asia. So how did that affect you? Like as a kid, were you withdrawn? Like did you overcompensate and try to be more American? Like how, how were you? Yeah, I definitely tried to then fit in with all of the American kids. But then that all would just crumble when I would invite them over mm -hmm. and they would see like the food that we were eating or just seeing the fact that my grandparents also lived with us and like mm -hmm. helped raise us because that's kind of like a Korean tradition is that the oldest son in the family will take care of the grandparents in their old age. Mm -hmm. So they lived with us and stuff. So it was like a lot of people in one house. It was four, five, six, seven, eight people in a house. Wow. Yeah. Did you like that though? Did I you, loved it. You, you liked growing up with a big family. Yeah. And I liked that if like my mom and dad weren't home, it's like I had second parents. Like my grandparents were basically my second parents. Mm -hmm. I would rather like spend time with them than my parents really even. Mm -hmm. So I was always downstairs because my dad had completely like decked out our basement for them. And it was like a whole house down there. And I just mm. had a blast. Like they would let me ride my bike through it when it was still concrete. So I would just ride my bike at the house and it was it was the best. I love that. I do think that in American culture, because there's a lot of other cultures as well that, you know, the the family really remains as one unit and like the grandparents yeah. stay with the kids and, and they all, you know, have that community upbringing. And, and here it's like this tradition of, Get out. Getting out as soon as you can, moving out yeah. the minute you turn 18. Um, and, you know, when your parents get too old to take care of themselves, like putting them like a in nursing a home, home yeah. and like making sure that like you have your own place. And, you know, there's a lot of shame around living with your parents. Right. You know, it's considered like something for people, you know, underachievers. Right. Full but disclosure, then... I live with my parents. <laughs> but then it's like, <laughs> if you flip it to a certain age, then yeah. it's like, oh, you're taking care of your parents. Yes. And it's like, wait, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, technically I am. And that's right? why I moved back in with them because I was taking care of my dad because he had Parkinson's towards the end of his life and my mom like couldn't manage it. So that is why we moved right. back in with them. But I, I will say like, it still feels weird for me to say to people like, I you know, live with my mom. Right. Like there's still the, like that nagging sense of shame. Like, oh God, girl lives with right. mom. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> 45, you know, like she, Jesus Christ. But it's like, I, she couldn't live by herself. Right. Like she literally, like we have to, she's, she's not, you know, senile by any means. But, oh no, she's still, she's hilarious. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. Oh, I keep forgetting God. you've met her and you've yes. been there, but she can't like, Especially on that big ranch. And like, cooking and stuff. Yeah, she yeah. can't. My grandmother's at the same place right now where she lost her like ability to be able to cook for herself. Mm -hmm. And so I was like bringing her kimchi to her little mm -hmm. like assisted living place whenever mm -hmm. I do go home to Georgia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she loves it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it is, it is kind of sad. Like the way that we isolate ourselves as, as families. And I don't know, I think that, 
might contribute to like that kind of loneliness epidemic right. that we have that's such a problem in this culture. Yeah. I feel like, you know, and people always say like it takes a village to raise children yeah. and then like their village doesn't really stick around or like yeah. doesn't try as much for you know, oh, they're not my kids, they're yours. Like, it's your problem or whatever yeah. when it comes to, like, grandparents sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it is crazy to yeah. see. I will say, like, when I did move back in with my parents, one of the bonuses I thought in my head was, like, oh, you know, they can help babysit Violet. Yeah. Nope. Cannot. No. no oh, no. Care, love my mom. She's the worst <laughs> babysitter in the world. Cannot trust her. <laughs> my Literally, I now I now have two toddlers. Just yeah. one of them is 78 years old. Oh my god! So it's okay. I think I'm also the worst babysitter because um I will easily get lied to. Like mm. I was watching um my nephews and they told me like oh like I'll take a Dr Pepper like I drink it all the time mm -hmm. and I was like oh okay sure mm -hmm. give them Dr Pepper and they that was the first soda they've ever had. But I was like how did they know to ask for Dr Pepper? And like so specifically, yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, but yeah, I easily get tricked and lied to by kids. I mean, I that makes sense to me though. Yeah, like that. I mean, <laughs> with the way, like the confidence right. with which he asked for yes. a Dr Pepper, I yeah. feel like I would feel the same. Yeah. So you know, I, I I can understand how you were tricked. I don't think that that has anything to do with you. I think you got some like smart ass. Was yes. that nephew? Yes. Yeah. Nephews. Smart, smart nephew. Yeah, I've got nephews and nieces now, yeah. but it's. I do always want to be there. Like, that is something that, like, my family has definitely kept is, like, mm -hmm. we always still want to be there. But, oh, my God, they're little liars. <laughs> yeah. A kid's going to be a CEO one day. Yes, I all hope of, so. <laughs> all of, like, these traits that are so annoying in children are so great. As adults. As adults, yes. you know? Like, oh my God, sense yeah. of independence, like, questioning authority. Right. Like, autonomy. Like, confidence. You know, confidence. Yeah, that's huge. Oh, even, my God, like, they're so manipulation confident. to a... To a sense. Slight degree. Yeah, that becomes like business <laughs> acumen when you're older. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> we call it something else. Yeah. But later it's fine. on. <laughs> Do you want to have kids yourself? Oh my gosh. This has been so heavy on my mind recently. I don't know yet. I How old are you? I'm 26. Okay. I think that's okay to and not know. I absolutely love kids. And like love like playing and being around them. But then I have so many things about myself where I'm like, oh, I would probably freak out like if I had like so like like drool on me to where I was like wet all over my shoulder. I wouldn't like that. Mm. I don't know. And there's just so many other little things where I'm like, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like so I'm back and forth constantly. Yeah. Well, I will say you're really young, right? So you have like so much longer. I mean, I didn't have you know, Violet until I was 40. Yeah. I waited maybe a little too long, but I'm glad I did because it ended yeah. up working out for the best. That is good. But, um, and also too, I will say not to like veer off too much into like talking about kids because <laughs> you probably want to start listening, hearing about Dick soon. Um, <laughs> but, uh, when it's your own kid, it's different. Yeah. Other kids drool on your shirt is gross. When it's your own child, it's a completely different story. And that's something that, like, I've also just wanted to experience because I I do think, like, everyone tells me it is so different. So and different. it completely, like, changes your life. Even yeah. shout out Sean Rivera. He yeah. was like, having a kid will give you, like, an all of a sudden purpose. Yeah. and Because oh, I told him, I was one. like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, we love you. You are a miserable <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> But a wonderful father. Yes, and I'm glad, incredible. I'm so glad he has a child in his life. Oh, Diana. yeah. Oh, my God. And she's amazing. But yeah, I've met her. She's, she's oh, really cute. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's definitely it's it's impossible to explain unless you have one. Um, but, you know, uh, let's talk about let's talk about porn people. Where why are we here? Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of podcast is this? Holly Randall, your career in the adult industry started with used panties. Yes. What inspired you to start selling them? So it was during the pandemic and I was working at the restaurant. I had worked restaurant industry for like six years already. Were you living and in Georgia still or were yes. you in LA at the time? Yeah, okay. still in Georgia. And the pandemic shut down all the restaurants and Georgia was the first state to cut off any kind of unemployment help. So I was definitely screwed mm -hmm. and we weren't getting any more checks and I had no idea what to do to pay rent. 
And my roommate at the time was like, hey, maybe you should like sell your like used panties, like as a joke almost. And I was like, okay, weirdo, like that's so odd. Like, I don't know. Google. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know. What a dumb I don't know idea. why he would say that. No, it wasn't <laughs> even actually me. So then he ended up pulling up a website where he was like, look, like I'm serious. Like you could actually make a lot of like money doing this or like selling socks or like feet pics or something like that. And I was like, huh. It always really? starts with the feet pics. Right. That's the gateway well, drug. Well, I didn't end up doing that. <laughs> but that was one of like the examples that he used was he was like, look, like, you know, this site like sells like, you know, they sell mainly panties, but like also other things like you can do whatever you want. And I was like, oh, my God. OK. So I thought about it. Can I ask what the site was? It was Panty Deal. Oh, I haven't heard about that one. So you have to pay a membership to be a seller. Mm -hmm. But the buyers get in for free so that there's more buyers than sellers. Mm -hmm. And I used quite literally my last $20 to pay that membership. Wow. And I uh, borrowed money from my mother, my <laughs> lovely mother, for dinner that night. <laughs> but I got to work immediately. I you was didn't like, tell her what you borrowed the money for, did you? No, it was for dinner. It truly was. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it was for dinner. But I used my last $20 for the membership. Same, same. But... I got to work immediately and was, like, just taking pictures of the panties. Okay. And people were then like, I want to see them on you. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I'm in panties. Like, fuck it. And so I would take pictures in the panties. And then I made, like, $2,000 my first month just doing that. Wow. And at the time, I was like, whoa. Like, this is incredible. I was able to pay my rent, which was really great. And I was able to feed myself and not ask my lovely mother for mm -hmm. money anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, then of course they started asking for videos in the panties and I was like, well, I can do that. And then I had the bright idea to upload those videos as well to the World Wide Web on other places to see if I could make some extra ad revenue or something like that. And it ended up like doing well there too. So... One step at a time. Yeah, baby, baby steps. <laughs> and then when did you get to a point where the panties came off? Yeah, once I started uploading those videos and like making the videos, it was pretty fast to where it was like, okay, just masturbating in the panties. And then after that, it was like, okay, strip teasing out of panties, doing panty try-ons and then masturbating outside of the panties. And then full on, like I was just making my own porn. What website were you uploading these to? The Hub. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, porn. And that was like... My main one and the only one pretty much because I didn't even know what OnlyFans was. Yeah. Wow. So I was putting my stuff on Pornhub before I even. But that's a good way to get traffic, though, because OnlyFans has zero discoverability, whereas right. obviously Pornhub has a lot. But then I actually found out what OnlyFans was on Panty Deal because girls were putting these little advertisements up for their OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. And I was like, mm, I'll try it. And so then I started there too. <laughs> right. So were you showing your face in these like at the beginning? Okay. Yes. And were you worried? So when you started uploading it to Pornhub, you must have like realized that, okay, this is a place. Like, did you know how much traffic they got? Like, were you aware that no. people might find out? Or did you still think that you were under wraps? I thought I would. Well, and I feel like I was under wraps like completely, but it wasn't until I started working, like, my first shoot for a mainstream company, that's when I was like, okay, I need to tell the people in my life mm -hmm. before they find out because right. I think this is going to be big. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and then when you started to shoot, like, you know, the more risky stuff, like, what was running through your head? Because you your family was pretty conservative that you grew up with, right? So my dad is definitely, like, the conservative kind and very entirely, like, strict – like women, like my mom wasn't allowed to sit at the dinner table because she wasn't Korean. And so sometimes they made her sit on the floor. It was crazy. But he was very, very strict. Wait, what? Yeah. Wow. Like at family dinners? So if we ever had like a big family dinner where it was all of us together, like nobody was at work, you know, and stuff uh -huh. like that. Yeah, my mom wasn't at the dinner table. She was on the floor because she's not Korean. and. So the kids were also on the floor at like little kids tables uh -huh. and it would be the kids and my mom. And I always thought like, oh, like mom's just here sitting to watch with us you guys. Yeah, and yeah. sitting with us. But I found out later that it was because 
she's what, not Korean, what? so she's not allowed with the rest of the Korean adults at Whoa. a regular table. <laughs> what was her ethnicity? So she is Vietnamese, Chinese, and white. Did she ever talk about how that made her feel or? Oh my God, yeah. She, well, she was with my dad since she was like in high school. They were high school sweethearts. Uh, okay. So that was kind of all she knew for a long time. Right. And then she just ended up getting tired of it and just how he was in general. Yeah. Because we weren't allowed to sing or dance. Those were like signs of the devil to him. Like, he, yeah, he was very conservative and wow. super like kind of weird. But um, she just got tired of it and then left and took all of us. Wow. Yeah. So your was your dad like religious conservative? I assume so. Yes. The devil. What what was his? So when we would go to church, it was a Korean church. Okay. And it was Presbyterian, I think. Okay. But I don't even know what that means, truthfully. Right. So. I yeah. Either. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Say kind of Christianity. Yeah. I don't know much else besides beyond that. Yeah. I it would, I know that like they would have like the regular Bible and then they would do a lot of songs, but most of them were in Korean. So you could sing in church, but not at home. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so. he would also let us listen to certain types of music, but like definitely not pop music. Lady right. Gaga, for some reason at the time, was definitely like the devil himself Wow. to him. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. But I'm lucky because my mom left. Mm -hmm. And like I always say, she kind of went a little bit buck wild. I um, bet. She's like, I'm going to sit at the fucking big adult table now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She made her own table. <laughs> she kind of let us have freedom for the first time, too, because mm -hmm. with my dad, it was very much so like so stereotypically Asian. Like we had piano lessons after school and then we had to sit and he would just scream at us while we were doing math, like way above our grade levels, too. And just like be like, how do you not know this? And like, you need to know this. And I'm like, I'm seven, but OK. <laughs> I'm 45 and I still don't know math. Right? And now I'm like, I hate math. I fucking hate it. Oh, math's but, so boring. It sucks so much. Yeah. But uh, my mom going buck wild kind of let us have freedom as well within reason she still was like a parent yeah. and like i love her to absolute death but um she was like don't get pregnant and don't die and so, i so, the sage advice yeah i followed that uh, all the way up until now <laughs> <laughs> and you're still alive and still not pregnant yes yes that, <laughs> made that, it. that advice stuck yeah <laughs> okay so when you you know decided to tell everybody that you were going to do porn. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you still talk to your dad? Do you guys have a relationship? No. Um, my thing was that I didn't go to college. And so even before porn, he was like, yeah, no, like, bye. Like, we're not okay. really talking. I do, like, still occasionally get, like, messages just, like, once a year that's, like, happy birthday. I'm mm -hmm. like, thanks. Mm -hmm. But that's the extent of it. Right. Um, I miss him all the time though and I always tell like people that ask like it's not only his culture but like how he was raised too yeah and it was a different time yeah so I kind of have to take that into understanding and just accept it yeah um everybody's doing the best with what they have yeah and not everybody has the proper toolkit right yeah. and I do get angry sometimes though just because like and it's not even like my accomplishments but my siblings accomplishments he completely misses and just doesn't even show up for because one got a tattoo of a cross and but tattoos were like a big no for him yeah. and then you know so on and so forth and he just misses out on all of that for yeah. them and it makes me so mad yeah but my mom I pulled her aside and I was like hey I'm just letting you know that I'm going to start doing porn like I just want to tell you before you find out because mm -hmm. it's going to be inevitable and she was like, okay, like as long as you're not getting like... Don't get pregnant and don't die. Yeah, but she was more <laughs> concerned a little bit about that. She was like, as long as you're not getting like yourself into any dangerous situations. Like I yeah. don't want you to accidentally fall into something where you're getting trafficked or like harmed. Mm -hmm. And so a few more rules to add to my collection. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, 
Yeah, I told her and then I would just, I do still, I update her about everything. I'm like, oh my God, like I get to do the Holly Randall podcast today. And she's like, Hi, good hey, for mom. you. <laughs> yeah. She's like, I'll watch it when it comes out. Mom, you can, you can sit at my table. Yes. I will put you <laughs> at the big table. Okay, it will not make you sleep, sit on the floor. Promise. And I love you. <laughs> but yeah. Wow. Um, That's crazy. So, Okay. You know, it's so interesting because there's so many parents, I've talked to so many performers that when they tell their parents, the first thing that comes up is sex trafficking. Yeah. Like so often they're like, their parents think that, are you being forced into this? Don't fall into sex trafficking. I mean, this sex trafficking like myth is so pervasive. It is huge. And I, of course, then I had that same fear in my mind Mm -hmm. once she had brought it up. But it's not until you get into the industry that you, again, know how professional it is Mm -hmm. and how different it is. And no one really, like, really no one is forcing you. Yeah. Can force you to be there if you don't want to be there. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be some smaller fly-by-night, not really, you know, recognized porn. Agents. Agents. Agents are generally the worst. Or, like, companies that you got to kind of be careful about. Right, and but avoid. if you do your research, like right. you can find the information that you need to make solid decisions. Right. And there's a lot of really good people in the industry. And generally it's like a business like anything else, you know, but people still right. have this idea like it's a seedy underbelly. And and again, like and it's so those things not. exist. Like they I'm never gonna say that they don't, but right. like it's not not to the extent even close to the way that like people imagine that it does. Right. It's the majority of not how we work. No. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? We're going to take a quick commercial break and then I would, I do want to hear about your first scene okay. and what that was like. <laughs> so stick around guys. We'll be right back. All right, guys. So summer is winding down. The days are getting shorter and you know what that means. Fall is in the air and with fall comes cuddle season. Whether you're cozying up by the fire or binge watching your favorite shows, you want to be ready for those intimate moments. That's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. No more awkward visits to the doctor's office or waiting in line at the pharmacy. You can handle everything online and your prescription arrives right at your door in discreet packaging. So as the temperature drops and the cuddle season heats up, don't you want to be prepared? Blue Chew helps give you the confidence you need to perform at your best every single time. And trust me, your partner will notice the difference. Get ready to make this cuddle season one to remember. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 in shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY to receive your first month for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Hello, guys. We are back. Okay, so can we let's talk about this first mainstream scene that you did. So you've been, you know, you started off selling your panties. Yeah. You went on to Pornhub. You started distributing content there. Yeah. You got an OnlyFans like everybody does. And then you felt like the big Hollywood world of porn <laughs> beckoning you. <laughs> Um, How did you arrive to Los Angeles? Well, it wasn't LA. Mm. Was it Miami? It was Miami. Oh. But um, (laughs) I had a performer reach out to me through TikTok Mm -hmm. and say like, hey, like you're kind of doing this backwards. Like, you know, companies will post on Pornhub for you and then that's how you get your big exposure and stuff like that. And within 12 hours, I was literally driving down to Miami after she talked to me. Um, she hooked me up with her agent at the time and, um, I met him for about two seconds. He drove me straight to testing and then told me I had seen the next day. And I was like, okay, this is all like real fast. Mm -hmm. Like they don't give you time to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So I then get picked up by the other girl who's joining my scene Mm -hmm. for the scene that day. And had you done, had you had sex with people like on OnlyFans no. Okay, so you'd never never even collabed. Okay. I had only So this been is doing very new solo. for you. Yes. Okay. And I didn't know if I I was having this internal like conflict with myself like okay, so like should I fake it? Like should I like be like real and like you know, an actual like representation of like what women like sex for women is like? No. 
Or no, no, I you should like, fake it. <laughs> or should I be like faking it and like <laughs> pretending and like, you know, all like all is great and oh my god, it's so good. Um, but I meet the guy and he has such a cute, sweet accent. And I was like, oh, I like the way you say counter. And then he <laughs> did not speak to me for the rest of the fucking day. <laughs> he hated me. I'm pretty sure he still hates me. And I'm sorry, I guess, but not really. But um, we're, we get to the first scene and no one tells me how to use a douche either. So I'm like trying to get it to squeeze out without having popped the lid up and nothing's happening. So I just... I have it inside me. I'm just squeezing it and nothing's coming out. And so I just take it out, throw it away. And I'm like, done. <laughs> <laughs> Get into sex and everything. And then he, they put us in a stack and everything's going super fast. Can you explain what a stack is to people who may not know? Right. So basically just two girls laying on top of each other and the guy going back and forth between each girl. And so he's doing that. And then I feel like sharp pain. And I'm like, what is happening? I scream a little bit. So then the guy, I don't remember who it was, but the guy filming was like, uh, what's, what's wrong? Cause I screamed mm -hmm. and he, I was like, oh, I was like, something just really hurt. And then the guy was like, oh, I just slipped on some lube. And I was like, oh my God. And I didn't even want to look down there, but I knew that like something was wrong because I just kept going and it hurt like more than anything I've ever felt in my life. So I clean up, go home. After. Wait, you finish the scene? Yes, I finish the scene and it's out. Oh my God. <laughs> and it's out. Um, I finished the scene. I think this was a discipline that your father instilled in you at a young oh, age. Oh, for sure. It has to be <laughs> because I'm still like that. Yeah. And I have to like learn to unlearn that. Yeah. Entirely. And I'm I'm still working on it, but <laughs> um <laughs> You're like, gotta get through. Yes. Uh, I finished the scene. How much longer did you have to shoot for? I have no idea. I was literally just like white knuckling through it. Wow. And, and nobody noticed? Um, I mean, I know that I know that like sh the director said something. Yeah. And then obviously you must no, have. No, and then they offered me more lube and they were like really nice, uh, but they were just going fast. Yeah. And they were just off, you know, gave me yeah. more lube, was like, are you good? And I was like, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm okay. good because right, right. I wanted the check my yeah. first check and my first check made me ball my eyes out I was like I had never had that much money in a day before like I cannot believe that this is real like actually real and then I went back to my hotel that I was staying at you know fell asleep and woke up and got called to do it the next day show up to set as soon as that guy tries to put his stick inside me tears I couldn't do it start crying mm. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm not like this at all. I'm not a crier. But um, he's like, let me see, like, what's wrong with you? And he's like, oh, babe, you're ripped. He takes a picture and shows me because it was down um, towards my, like, perineum and down towards my asshole. And he was like, It, like, ripped to the me. outside? Or so he... The rip was, like, two centimeters down from my vagina, like, to my asshole. Not all the way, like... Not all the way through, but yeah. Yeah, I know. I've, I mean, yeah. When you have a baby, you generally rip. Right. So like yeah. I ripped and I didn't even get a baby out of it. <laughs> you got a check though. Yeah, I got that check though. <laughs> but um, that day I could not finish that scene. That's crazy. Okay. Because when I ripped, when I had um my baby TMI, sorry, <laughs> um, I was so scared to like poop for a week yeah much less like put a dick in me oh my god well, I don't think my rip was like that severe like coming because mine only actually, required like two stitches mine wasn't that bad either I like because some girls rip all the way luckily yeah luckily I didn't require any stitches um I didn't end up going to the hospital for a while until I lost the feeling in my hands and my feet because the rip ended up, sorry, long story. <laughs> the rip ended up getting infected because I kept trying to do stuff. Oh. And the infection uh, basically gave me a s sort of sepsis. It spread through my spinal cord and I lost the feeling in my hands and my feet. Ah! So I had to go to the hospital. Oh, no. 
And that agent was yelling at me. Oh, no. Screaming, how fucking dare you? How dare you? Yeah, how dare you lose out on all these shoots I just got you. No one will ever work with you again. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, that's so horrible. That was the first time I yelled at a man, though, because I yelled back. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. So how did you feel after that? Like, were you disappointed in yourself? Yeah, I felt... So, it's a long story, but I checked myself out of the hospital against medical advice once I kind of started feeling a little bit better, where I was confident that I wasn't going to lose my hands and my feet. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, like, I'm basically good. I'm still on medication, like, but I'm pretty good. And I continued to do scenes. There's one scene um, that I couldn't feel my hands, and I was on a massage table, because of course. Mm -hmm. And the guy put his dick in my hands, and I didn't know what was there. So he goes, grab it. And I was like, oh, because I still couldn't really feel my hands. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But um, after that trip was over, I didn't shoot for months. Yeah. Because I needed to heal. And then I also wasn't really necessarily confident in my ability to do this. Yeah. Because I was like, if this is what it's going to be like all the time, like, I don't know if like I can handle it. Yeah, of course. And I don't know if like. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. And then um, that agent at the time was like so done with me because he just thought that I was crazy. (laughs) Yeah. And he was like, why don't you go to L.A. and shoot there? Because like, I don't think like Miami's for you. And so I went to L.A. and then I just kept coming back to L.A. First of all, I I just want to say I'm so sorry. I hate it when you hear those stories and then like you get like made to feel guilty about the fact that like you got injured. Right. It's like oh, crazy, okay. you know, <laughs> like, it's just like, ah, that makes me so, especially as a woman, yeah. like, and, and your agent yelling at you. I remember there was a girl that I was shooting once and I think same thing. She'd had like a rip or something had happened to her the day before and her agent made her come to set and she was like sitting in the makeup chair and she basically like told me what happened. And then she like kind of started crying Ugh. and I was like, there is no way I'm going to let you shoot. Like, that's crazy. Right. Like you need to go home and heal. And yeah, and I called her agent and he, yeah, was like, she's, she's lying. Doing it. Yeah, yeah, like she's lying. Oh like God. she, and I was like, she's like, she's fine. And yeah, same thing. I was like, you have no but idea. You can see when, like, you can but see. But also, like, if a woman comes to me and tells me that, like, she's in pain and she can't do the scene, I'm just going to trust her. Right. And I'm just right. going to believe her. And she's, I'm going to send her home. Right. Because why would we lie our way out of our own jobs? Yeah. There's like, and, and no even, sense in that. Even if it wasn't, even if it was a lie, right? And it was something right. else. Like, obviously, you don't want to do the upset. scene. Like, there's yeah. something going on. And, like, yeah. I don't want to shoot you in a scene if you don't want to do right. it. Right. Because that's, like, yeah, that's something you can't take back. Right. And it's, Entirely. like, a horrible feeling to work with someone who doesn't want to be there. Right. It's, like, you know, I don't ever want to be a part of that. Yeah. I. That's why I, even when I do collabs, I'm like, okay, like, Everybody is like really, really good, right? Yeah. Like we're doing great. If we're yeah. not feeling good, we'll just do it later. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, w- now we have like boundary checklists and all this kind of yes. stuff. Yes. I mean, you know, most of the the bigger companies. So you were so you started in Miami and then you started working in LA. I've heard from so many performers that the industry culture is very different in Florida than it is. Yes. In LA, like very different. Tell me, like, what the difference is. I actually went back for the first time in like two years recently. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's still like this where it's like the guys aren't as caring about – and the companies. There is not checklists. Mm-hmm. They don't really care like if you're good or not. Mm-hmm. It's just a little bit less professional. Yeah. And – it's still, you know, you still fill out paperwork and everything. It's yeah, well, just, you need that. Otherwise, you'd go to jail. Right. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it just feels like the guys are kind of like, we run this and we do whatever we want. Right. Whereas out here, I feel like it's more like communal. Like, okay, like everybody has to be good and not just the dudes. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, we just care about if his dick's hard. Not if you're like, we don't care about you. Like, you're just one of 8 million new girls that they're going to shoot, you know? So that's kind of what it's like. Yeah. I feel like. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, like I said, I've heard that from so many people. I've never shot in Florida. So, um, I mean, I guess I wouldn't have that experience because I'm a director and I run my own sets. So 
Right. You know, like I'm never on like other people's sets because I'm not a performer, but I've heard that from so many people. So that's just, that's crazy. So you're doing porn. Obviously, like you're, you know, doing well at it, right? Thank like you. that first experience is like <laughs> oh, behind yeah, you. Over with. <laughs> so um, I saw somewhere where you kind of talked about, you know, like dealing, still having like a sense of shame yes. around sexuality, like from your upbringing. And I think that that's so common for so many people. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? Well, when I was first starting like having sex, I felt dirty. Mm -hmm. And, and this I, is like sex in your personal life? Yes. Okay. When I first started having sex, I felt dirty, like to the point where I had heard that and like being young and like stupid, I had heard that hydrogen peroxide would like kill all bacteria. And like, I thought, okay, so every time after I would have sex, I would literally douse myself, including my vagina with hydrogen peroxide until bad things happened. Jesus <laughs> Christ. And it was because I wanted that feeling of, like, being dirty off of me. And I yeah. thought that, like, that did it for yeah. me. Um, now I'm much more normal. <laughs> <laughs> you don't take hydrogen peroxide showers not, anymore? Jesus I Christ. I do not. I do still kind of struggle, though, like, with that sense of feeling dirty creeping back up. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm much better at kind of... Being happier with my, like, independence and sexuality and, like, knowing that, like, I'm, like, just because I'm a woman, like, I can do these things yeah. instead of feeling like I can't. Yeah. And, like, expressing it and being happy about it. Yeah. I just think that slowly over time I learned that and I'm getting better still. But yeah. I think I'm pretty much all the way there. I kind of think it's a hard thing to unlearn. And I feel like nobody's ever really free from the shackles of their childhood. Right. Right. Whatever was ingrained in you from it's a young always age going to affect us. It's always going to be there. Right. There's never that moment where you're like, I'm free and I never have these thoughts again. Right. Like they always come back in some form or another. Yeah. Did your parents believe that you should wait till marriage to have sex? Definitely. My dad, my mom, I think, probably would say no mm. like she when I had my first threesome I told her so and she wasn't necessarily happy for me she was like okay TMI but yeah. like all right good for you I guess but <laughs> yeah I think she's she doesn't have that mindset anymore she probably did though like when she first was with my dad yeah before kind of I guess realizing that like that's not really what she would want for her kids. Because how do you know if you're sexually compatible with someone mm -hmm. if you don't have sex with them? Well, the problem is, too, is with that idea is that, you know, women aren't supposed to be sexual anyways. Right. Right. So, like, it doesn't matter if you're sexually compatible because you're really just there to, like, you know, be have, used. To, yeah. Ooh. And to have, like, babies and to, like, serve your husband. Right. So who cares if you're sexually compatible because that's not, like, your purpose on this planet. Which obviously is like, I believe it's bullshit. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But it's a hard thing to to get past. And women are mm -hmm. always being shamed for being sexual. Yeah. Like always. But also it's that one thing that like they can monetize so easily too, right? right? So it's a strange thing where it swings both ways. Like you can be shamed so much for it and you could also make a lot of money for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, I never really realized that though. Yeah. That our sexualities are so monetizable. Yeah. Until until I found this until place. Until you figured it out. <laughs> and then you yeah. were like, oh, okay, this like works for me. Yeah. But even like, I don't know, you just never think that's a possibility. Yeah. Oh, it's so crazy. Yeah. I mean, you and I were raised very differently, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like I always knew that was there. Oh my gosh, but, that's true. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but it's like, it's a weird thing, right? Because... Now that I'm a mom, I have to try to navigate these waters of obviously like not. Not my Korean dad, but not my buck wild mom. Yeah. Middle. Yeah. Like finding, you know, what's like the appropriate way to, I mean, you know, my daughter's three. So like this is not on our radar at any right. point. But, you know, just like when we get to that point, how can I encourage like sexual freedom, but also like responsibility. Right. Too, you know. But I think that's. 
a great thing being in the business because we're so educated on testing. Yeah. And even like what the tests mean and like the mm-hmm. antibodies and stuff mm-hmm. like that and how like spreading happens and stuff. So, I mean, that yeah. is such a plus. Yeah. And being able to feel comfortable talking to your kids about that. Yeah. You know, like recognizing that, okay, like if they're going to be sexually active, they can come to me and they can talk to me about it and I can right. make sure that they're protected and like right. educate and them. Right. And not just use hydrogen peroxide not all over them. use hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. That's what happens when you don't talk to your kids about sex. Exactly. They don't know <laughs> how to deal with it, right? Because like a lot of times they're going to do it anyways. Yeah. So like why not, you know, engage oh, in harm yeah. reduction? The first time I had sex and I got cum on my belly button, I was so afraid I was able to get pregnant through it seeping through my belly button. Really? Yeah. Wow. Crazy because Georgia, yeah, not a lot of sex education. No, yeah, but no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <Yeah. laughs> um, so what is dating like for you being a porn star? Dating, um, at first, I felt like I didn't have any time to date. I was like, okay, like this is all going so fast. I don't feel like I, I'm meeting so many new people too, and like. Like, what if I don't choose the right one? Because, like, everyone seems so great at the beginning. And then you find out, like, that they have allegations and it's horrible. Did that happen to you? Oh, no. Thankfully. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, even just seeing someone on set and thinking, like, oh, like, what a great guy. Yeah. Or, like, what a great woman. Yeah. Then it's just seeing stuff coming out on the Internet. Oh, yeah. No, I've had people evidence. on my podcast where I'm just like, ooh. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, like six months later. I'm oh, like, that's so scary. Oh. <laughs> Maybe I should take that episode down. Right? That is so scary. Didn't know that at the time. Or like I've had to like cancel them because something came out and I was like, oh. Oh, no. Yeah, it was so awkward. Oh, that is (laughs) awful. Yeah. But dating, I think, is almost the same because I'm still the same person. I just have this added pressure of like, what if someone wouldn't like that? Like my job, I guess. Which is is a common problem, right? Because yeah. most guys don't want to share their woman with other men, even if it's just a job. Right. And I think that dating like someone in the industry would is, is so easy because you have someone that does understand. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, it's a job. And then we can talk about work. And then it's just work. And it's not like, oh, like... Mm-hmm. Because even, like, for me, like, I am, like, an extremely jealous person. Mm. So, like, I... So you don't think that you could date a male performer? Oh, I think it would depend. Because if it was, like, I don't know, it would really depend. It would have to be someone that's, like, very, very good at communication and, like, I know is like soup business and mm-hmm. not like <laughs> yeah just a la 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 <laughs> yeah 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 all the time but yeah no I understand yeah possibly <laughs> I no I get it I get it I mean it's okay to like recognize that you know maybe it wouldn't easily go both ways for you yeah right because you are you are dating somebody now but they're not a performer right it just ends up working mm-hmm. it just ends up working so much easier because. Yeah, they know that it's just a job and we are able to talk about work and yeah, it's it's great. Before you met him, did you try to date other guys and had issues or were you just working so much you were like, I'm not even looking? Well, I had like little crushes, but they were married or already Mm -hmm. had girlfriends and like I didn't want to overstep or anything. And I had, I am someone that will fall in love with anyone that's nice to me. So, like, I'll have, like, an intense crush for, like, a day Mm -hmm. and then find out, you know, like, oh, they're married or, like, they have a girlfriend. Okay, cool. We're just, like, really good friends then. Yeah. Um, So I had, like, the little crushes and stuff like that. But then, yeah, I never really wanted to to date. Right. And so now with the relationship that you have, do you guys ever have jealousy issues that come up? Like, when do you know that you need to communicate about something? I think that it's really trial and error. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about boundaries, like, and then 
not realize even like if you don't realize that something is a boundary until it happens yeah like that's okay but hey next time like this is a boundary for me and that's just constantly changing too Mm -hmm. so like constantly like oh yeah and like you know what i'm fine with that i'm fine with that cool but you just have to constantly keep talking yeah and that's what it's that's the only way it's going to work yeah in this industry is if you just constantly are updating each other and talking and communicating about like what you're okay with and what you're not and like what you want and expect and everything. (laughs) Yeah. I remember when I was interviewing, I think it was Jet Setting Jasmine and she's, you know, in a relationship with King Noir. I've had them both on both amazing guests. And I remember her because they have an open relationship and they both perform. And I remember her talking to me about how yeah, like boundaries and consent is fluid and it changes. Yes. And I don't know why I had never thought about that before. I think because yeah. I'm in like a pretty like vanilla monogamous relationship where like, you know, we don't, we're not with other people. We're just with each other. So yeah. like, it feels like that like feels simple, I guess. But, you know, she talked about, I think like when, cause she's, she's had a couple of kids with him when she's pregnant, she needs like him more. Right. And like, she's not as open to him dating other girls and like, that's okay. Cause they talk about that. And then, you know, when she's at a different stage in her life, it might change. And I don't know why it had never occurred to me that, yeah, of course, like boundaries might change. Yeah. Entirely. Um, And that like that constant communication is like so important. Even like with between partners, like if you are with someone different, like your boundaries can be different. Yeah. And that's something that I've had to learn. Like, okay, like with you, like even just with performing, it's like, okay, with you, I know that like, you know, you do this right or like you do this this way. So like I don't have that boundary with you like I would with someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is crazy. It's a different kind of world to navigate. Yeah. I guess, right? But obviously it works for you. So you do a day in the life of a mattress actress series on TikTok. Um, what are people most surprised to see about what porn sets really look like? A lot of the comments that I get are, oh, my God, there's actually a script. Like, I thought that was a joke. <laughs> and sometimes you guys don't realize that these scripts are like 30 pages long. Oh my God, they're so long sometimes. There are some times where we genuinely have to, like, memorize it with the, the time from the time that it's given to us until we film it. And sometimes that is not enough time. Yeah. Sometimes it's like okay, we should have been given this like a week in advance. Yeah. But um, yeah, a lot of people are surprised that there's scripts, that there is like consent and that we pre-plan some of our positions sometimes Mm -hmm. depending on the company or depending on what the scene like wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of that is just shocking for them to see. Yeah. I also want to talk about a TikTok that you did recently that actually like – my uh, my DP showed me. Uh, you did a, I think it was on an adult time set with um, a bunch of other Asian actresses. Yes. And it was like, how much time did you put into the that? The High School Musical reading. Yes, because <laughs> that was like very involved and like your timing, yeah. everyone's timing was like on. Yes. So that was all thanks to Allison Ray, who is their social media um, manager. So funny. She's coming on the podcast next week. Oh my God. That's so awesome. She, Allison, I love you. She is so lovely. And she is just on it and brilliant and Mm -hmm. like gets an idea and knows how to execute it Mm -hmm. entirely because I could not direct eight girls that way. Yeah. There's no way. But she was like, okay, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. Like, go. And like, but she was like, are you, she came up to me and was like, are you familiar with High School Musical? And I said, yes, of course. That and Spy Kids were like my Bible. (laughs) And um, (laughs) my daughter loves Spy Kids. Okay. I haven't had her watch High School Musical yet. Oh my God. She does love, she's three. Oh, oh, I thought you said you hadn't seen it. Oh no, I haven't seen it either. Are you kidding? I'm 45. Oh no, I'm 40. Tomorrow I'm 46. Tomorrow's (laughs) my birthday, by the way. Well, happy early birthday Thank again. you. Yeah, no, I've never seen it. That's insane. You have to watch it. It's such a Do classic. Do I know? Okay, well, Do I, I really feel the same way about like it. Rocky and stuff like that because- I've also never seen Rocky. When my, okay, so I'm not alone. When I, um, someone had asked me, do you know Sylvester Stallone? And I was like, yeah, from Spy Kids. <laughs> and he Wait was a minute, like, that's Antonio Banderas. No, 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 he's the dad. So Antonio Banderas is the oh. dad. Um, Sylvester Stallone's the bad guy in Spy Kids. I think it's Which like Spy Kids. I think it's Spy Kids. 
three. How many Spy Kids are there? There's four. The fourth one is awful. Don't watch it. Oh. But the first three okay. are incredible. Yeah, okay. I need to I need to rewatch my Spy Kids to catch up on my facts. But <laughs> Okay, so why why were we talking about this? I because have no you've idea. never seen Rocky. Spy Kids. Yeah, I've never seen you... Rocky. Someone was making fun of me for saying Sylvester Stallone was from Spy Kids. Uh, but why did Spy Kids come up? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. I don't know. Oh, because of the TikTok. Oh, okay. High School Allison, Musical. Allison Ray was like, are you familiar with High School Musical? And I said, yes. And yeah, she just immediately directed everyone, told them what to do, showed us. It was like, okay, this is your line to close books. And then all march around her. And it only took like maximum like 20 minutes, I feel like. Wow. Yeah. But I did feel bad because we had asked Bree and Casey to be uh, background high schoolers, you know, just sitting there reading a book and talking, but not really talking because we were trying to do this. Yeah. And so they sat there just doing nothing for like 20 minutes and we all felt really bad. Yeah. But it ended up looking so great and hilarious. And I, I love it. And it did it do well? Like, has oh, it gotten a lot of views? I don't know. I, I have to go check, but I think on their TikTok, on Adult Times TikTok, it did really well. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny because so that kind of sparked a conversation between me and Jeff where we were talking about, because, you know, we're working on this new platform and we're like doing like TikToks and a lot of social media stuff. I had to hire like somebody entirely yeah. different to do TikToks because it's not my jam. But TikToks help so much. I know. So So we were talking about how social media has changed so much, right? And yeah. now it's become like the main way to promote content yes. and how we still get stuck in this kind of like old timey, that's not the right word, but we still get stuck in this like way of thinking where it's just like a waste of time. And like, we have a scene to shoot, you know, right. and we have like all this stuff to do. And this is the most important thing is like right. completing the scene and getting this done and getting this out there. And obviously that's incredibly important because you don't right. have a scene, whatever, but like, it's if so no hard to adjust thing. your thinking to acknowledging how important social media is right. and how taking that 20 minutes to shoot that would greatly increase like the promotion of that scene. Yes. And so, so anyway, so I was just, I was watching that and I was thinking about that and I was thinking about, you know, if I had been the director on that set, how it would have been really hard for me to not to be watch. like annoyed with like right. how much that was taking away from my time to film the scene. Right. But recognizing that, yes, it is important. But I think it also does help because all of the performers there were very much so like down to do the social media yeah. stuff. Like none of us were complaining. So I feel like as a director, like it's easier to be like, okay, like everyone's fine with this, yeah. taking a little bit more time than usual, you know? So like they're okay. Yeah. Rather than I feel like if someone was like, oh, really? Like, I don't want to do this. Then as a director, it would be up to you to be like, okay, like we don't have to, you know? Yeah. Or like, okay, like let's just move on then. But if like you're booked for a scene and that scene includes like promotion of the scene right like right. Say, taking pretty girls right right like that's technically promotion for the scene because that's, that's the kind true. of stuff that you can might be put on the box cover or put on instagram or whatever like right. you don't complain about that that's so true right? so yeah. it's just it was just it gave <laughs> me it was making me think about like just adjusting my thinking in this new world right. of social media and um promotion and stuff yeah. marketing i don't know and specifically tiktok because mm -hmm. that's different than I feel like any other social media. Totally. It's but it's life changing. Also. And it's also the one that hates porn the most. Yeah. But it also sends you the most traffic. Yes. Yes. But so. it also, yeah, it has the ability to change anyone's life. Yeah. Like anyone. So yeah. it's crazy. It is like the thing to focus on right now, but mm -hmm. it is so hard, honestly. Yeah. Like I even like growing up being in dance and gymnastics and stuff, it's still hard yeah. <laughs> to do TikTok dances. Yeah, I'm not. No, not for me. <laughs> not for me. All right. Well, Kimmy, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I have a couple of extra questions for you from my Patreon members, um, which we're going to do in a separate little segment. So stick around for that. If you are a Patreon member, you'll be able to access that at patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. In the meantime, Kimmy, can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Yes, you can always find me at onlykimmy.com. All of my social medias and sites will be linked there. 
And you can find me at hollylinks.com. Same thing, all my social media and everything is linked there. Or if you're just lazy and you want to follow me on Instagram, it's instagram.com slash Holly Randall. Um, I already gave you my Patreon link. If you want to support this podcast, watch these interviews live and get access to bonus Q&As like we're about to do. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I will see you next week.